Hey everyone, it's Josh here and so excited to have you join with us for another Anthem Online. Uh, so glad that you have joined with us with your family, wherever you're at, whether you're watching in Canada, the US, or even beyond. Uh, so happy you're with us. A couple things we want to let you know about. We're in season three right now and uh, we're going to be launching an initiative here pretty soon. It's called the Neighbor Next Door uh, Foundation uh, here at Anthem. Uh, we're going to be launching specifically the Christmas for Kids project, which is going to be providing Christmas for the kids in our children's hospital right next door. Uh, so we're going to be announcing that pretty soon that our members here can get involved in and that even you at home watching online could get involved in as well. So we're really excited to be able to step in into uh, a, new, a new phase of Anthem, really trying to reach out um, beyond what we do here. Hey, we're just about ready to start worship. Uh, the band is getting ready. People are entering the auditorium. Uh, we would love to have you come on in with us wherever you're at. Uh, join together with your family around your couch, your living room, your kitchen, wherever you're at, and just begin to turn your hearts towards God and what He is doing um, in your life, giving Him praise for the gospel, for His grace, His love, His mercy. Let's worship together. Good morning. Welcome to Anthem Church family. Stand up, sing with us, and we'll worship our God. tried so hard to see it it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve it to glory yeah. you are my 
wave if that's what you're feeling like. Take a minute, welcome each other. We're so happy you're here. Let's continue to worship and sing our next song.
What a beautiful promise. Sing that one more time. He shall meet her in a rose of wine. The blazing sun shall be. the Holy Spirit to come into our worship. I'm not a pastor, I'm not a priest, I'm not perfect. But is that the kind of church God even wants? Pews full of professional consumers, dressed up with happy Sabbaths, filled with haystacks? Where do I fit into God's church? Being a church member can't just be a title, a name, an assigned seat. It's a call to action. God didn't ask me to be a professional. God asked me to be a disciple. So the seats we had were excellent. I mean, they were exceptional. 
almost courtside. In fact, it was the kind of experience that you kind of think of salvation. You say, I didn't pay anything for this. I don't deserve this. I certainly couldn't afford it, but I'm really grateful for it. So there we were sitting watching the game between the Los Angeles Clippers and the San Antonio Spurs. Now, I'm sorry, Vic. I've always been a Spurs fan. So I was watching, trying to cheer for my team. I was vastly in the minority, and it wasn't going well for the Spurs. So it's getting, la- <laughs> it's getting late in the game, and Popovich, Greg Popovich, head coach for the Spurs, calls a timeout, gathers his team around, and you know I don't know what he's saying. He's trying to rile them up, trying to get them going, trying to come up with a plan. Somehow we're still going to pull this out. And I was watching them, and it was right then that Popovich looked up at me, Sandy, looked right at me. Now, I know you're thinking, come on, Randy, what other thing are you going to come up with? Well, I want to show you a picture, actually. I took this with my phone, uh, no telephoto, nothing else, so, so here's the picture that I took of Greg Popovich. Now, that was from my seat. Now, you can see he's looking right at me. And I know what he was thinking. He was sitting there thinking, what, you're in the stands? What are you doing up there? Get down here, Randy. We need your help. We're trying to win this game. I know that's what he was thinking. He tried to say it because I could see his lips moving, but the noise of the crowd drowned it out. And I know what you're thinking. (laughs) Thinking, Randy has totally lost it. Completely and fully, because he's not even a rank amateur when it comes to basketball. When it comes to basketball, he's an unprofessional layperson. That's the bottom line, and Vic is a witness. (laughs) I remember another situation. This one, my emotion was very different. This one, I actually felt a little bit scared. Not scared in the teeth-chattering sense, but a little bit worried about what was to come. So I was a resident chaplain up at the medical center. The chaplain department chair at that time was a gentleman named Larry, Jerry Davis. And he thought, if you're going to be a chaplain and you have times where you're talking with families about autopsies, the physicians have laid out what's going to happen. And now you're there helping them walk through this. It is a good idea for you to have an idea of what it is that's actually being discussed. So Jerry had arranged and here there was a group of four, five, six of us going in to watch an autopsy. And I'll have to tell you, I felt a very different sense. So we walked into the room, and there was a woman's body on the table. And I was quite overwhelmed. I'll be very honest with you. It was different than anything I had ever seen. Dr. Dick Combs, eminent pathologist, great thinker, great student of Scripture, taught pathology and biochemistry here for many years, was the pathologist doing the autopsy. He was very gracious. I could tell he was busy, had a lot to do, but he was kind. He told us what we were seeing and told us what he was seeking. It was intense. As I was looking back, thinking about that this past week, I thought he had this list of other autopsies he had to do. There was a lot weighing on his mind. There was a lot in terms of the teaching. He just had a couple of professionals there. I'm surprised, I thought, that he didn't say to me, Randy, put on a coat. Get up to the table. Give us a hand. Help us. (laughs) and you're not surprised because you're thinking when it comes to pathology you're a rank you're not even a rank amateur you're an unprofessional layperson seems like I bump into that in many places in life I bumped into it with my dad my dad was a mission pilot a bush pilot had thousands and thousands of hours flying in very difficult circumstances So I remember being with him in the plane that day. We were coming into a high-altitude mountain village in the Sierra Madre Mountains of central Mexico. It was a difficult landing strip because, to begin with, it had a bit of a hill ahead of the landing strip with some tall trees, so you had to get down quick. But then at the other end of the strip, there was a tall mountain. So if you missed sticking the landing, it was sayonara because there was no way you could pull up and get out of there. 
But dad had flown in here many times. I was sitting in the right seat, the front two seats. He was in the left seat. I was in the right seat. And dad did what pilots call a forward slip. I had never done a forward slip before. Forward slip means you got to get down fast. And so the pilot, you're headed this way. The pilot turns the nose of the plane that way and dips the wing down and the nose down and you go down really fast. And I, all I knew was that suddenly I was looking out of the side of the plane at an airstrip that was coming right up at us fast. Freaked me out. And I, thinking about it this week, thought, why didn't Dad say, Randy, quick, help me, help me. I need your help. <laughs> Surprised me he didn't. A few moments later, we were on the ground, alive, with me thinking, man, I am not even a rank amateur. I'm an unprofessional layperson. Seems like everywhere I go in life, I encounter that. Our world, our increasingly specialized world, is dominated by professionals. It's as it should be. But make no mistake about it, it's dominated wherever you look. People who have been educated and trained and mentored, people who have been tested and tried and proven, people who have been given certificates and confirmations and licenses, people who are professionals in their fields. And it doesn't seem to matter where you go. You can go to medicine, you can go to academics, you can go to business, you can go to economics, you can go to sports. For heaven's sake, sitting in the chair of the woman who cuts my hair, there's her license right in front of me. No matter where you go, professionals. And then we come to church. Then we come here and think, well, doesn't it work here like it works out there? Well, the Christ followers who were part of the founding of the early church would have deeply differed with that, would have deeply disagreed with that. We're going to go to just one of them, and that's Peter, blustering, blundering Peter. In his first epistle, 1 Peter, he writes about the people of God. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, just a brief overview of what we're about to read, and that'll help locate us a bit more as we read it. So Peter is writing to the people of God, and he makes reference to the people of God. That was the Christ followers in that day, and that's us in our day. He makes reference to the people of God by using several different terms. The key term is living stones. He's not talking about rolling stones. He's talking about living stones. He calls us living stones because we are part of the temple that God is building. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We're living stones with the temple that God is building. But then he has other titles that he will use. He'll say you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. You're God's people. He has a very specific point he's making. I want to read it with you and notice how this unfolds. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you're his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I'm placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him, recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone, and he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You're royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy." Peter is saying the temple, the location of God's presence is no longer going to be in Jerusalem. God is now building a temple that pushes 
past every national boundary. It is a temple that will be worldwide. It will be global. You are the living stones in that temple because you are God's people. Now, it's right there that I get interested. Because as he's describing that, he uses three Greek words. If you've never taken Greek a day in your life, or if, like me, you took it so long ago that you can't remember it, you have to keep going back to the helps. In either one of those categories, you'll probably recognize these terms. Because they're not English terms, but we have English terms that come from them. So I want to go back to 1 Peter 2.9 and read this from the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. Here's what he says. But you are a chosen race. Should be coming up there. And that's the word genos. Your chosen race, genos. A royal priesthood. A holy nation, ethnos. God's own people, laos. In order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He uses three terms. They have overlap to some degree in what they mean, but they also have uniqueness to what they mean. It's as though Peter is drawing a very wide boundary to begin with, and then it gets closer and smaller and more detailed and more specific until he ends up with this term, the laos of God, the people of God, from which we get our term laity, layperson. Except Peter is saying, we're all laos. You'll say that in the next verse. So notice, actually, let me first show you those three words and their specific meanings. So genos is a nation or people group. Ethnos is a large group based on various cultural, physical, or geographical ties. In the New Testament, it's often used of the Gentiles. And finally, laos, people. Or in the New Testament, it is often used of the people of God, both Jews and Gentiles. Remember then, the laos... The laity is all of us. The leaders, the members, we're all the laos. The ground is all level at the foot of the cross. So then we come to the next verse, verse 10. And Peter says, once you were not a people, laos, but now you are God's people, laos. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So as the Christian church was beginning, the laos of God, the people of God, included everyone in the body of Christ, the leaders as well as the members. There was no distinction. There was no hierarchy. You say, but wait a minute. So what's a pastor doing up teaching? Well, remember, Peter and Paul specifically will say the body does have certain gifts. As far as I'm concerned, I focus in on that gift called pastor-teacher. There is a gift in the body, but not above the body. In fact, years ago, here at Loma Linda University Church, and it's reflected here in Anthem, we made a change, a change that some thought was merely stylistic, but it was not. It was a theological change. So it used to be, many years ago, that here at church, the pastors and the elders who were leading in the worship that day would file onto the platform, and they would all sit across the front. They would all sit across the front, and you could watch them as they're trying to stay awake and jerking awake. You know, it, it, you know, it, it could be kind of rough. I read about a guy who was sitting in a church like that, and after the sermon was over, he said, do you know there are 262 panes in that stained glass window back there? Um, So we'd all file up and people would sit up there. But we stopped doing that. And the reason is simple. Because when the moment comes for somebody to lead, pastor, whoever the person is, we want that person to be down here as part of the body of Christ. And then when his or her moment comes, that person stands up and comes up here to help lead in what's happening and then returns back to the body. Because we're all on an equal level, on an equal plane in the body of Christ. That's what the New Testament says about the laos. We're all the laos, all the people of God. Furthermore, our church, long before I came here, had a cultural custom that I strongly believe in. 
And that was that no matter what you did in the world out there, no matter what you did in that building up there, no matter what you did in these classrooms over here, when you came to church, we were all on a first name basis because we're all equal. My name is Randy. I hope that's what you call me. Now, I will confess, I transitioned from up there down to here, and with some people, I never could make the transition. I mean, I'd known this person as doctor for years, you know, like Tom Zirkel. I just couldn't call him Tom, so I called him Dr. Zirkel. Our university president at that time, Lynn Barron, she said, call me Lynn. I said, thank you, Dr. Barron. I just couldn't <laughs> quite make that. So I know it's hard. I know it can be challenging. And I know somebody's having a challenge when they don't call me anything because they're not sure what to say. Randy, I love that culture because it's reflective of who we are as the laos of God, the people of God, the body of Christ where no one is over anyone else in a hierarchical sense. However, that is not the way in English we use terms like laity and clergy. In fact, I want to show you how those are defined by our good friend Webster. So notice how Webster defines laity. Here's the definition. Two of them, in fact. The people of a religious faith as distinguished from its clergy. In other words, you're distinguished by the fact that you ain't clergy. (laughs) Isn't that awful? The other is the mass of the people as distinguished from those of a particular profession or those specially skilled. In other words, when I said in Staples Center, I'm laity. When I stood in the lab, I was laity. When I sat in that place, I was laity. Distinguished from the professionals. But that's not church. So what happens? Well, when we accept that as the church definition, you know what becomes of the vast majority of the church? The vast majority of the church files in, sits down, stands up to sing, sits down to listen, throws something in the offering plate, goes home and says, I can't do anything there. That is not the New Testament model of church. In fact, no less a mind than John Stott, one of the great theological minds of the 20th century, in my opinion, said, to create hierarchy in church is to destroy the New Testament doctrine of the church, to destroy it. So what about clergy? How does Webster define clergy? This is how he defines it. A group ordained to perform pastoral or sacerdotal functions in a Christian church. A group ordained to do that. You know all the fighting we've had over ordination? It comes not out of Scripture. The word ordination doesn't even appear here. Though some can argue that the actions of such are there. It comes out of church history. And in church history, you had a group of people who were elevated to the post of clergy and ordained as such. They were now different than they had been before. I'll read a quote in a moment that underlines that. But that's not a biblical understanding of ordination. A biblical understanding of ordination is that this body of Christ has recognized in you or you or you. God has placed God's hands on that person and they have a giftedness for leadership in certain ways. And as we lay hands on them and pray that, we are recognizing, affirming your call. Because a call is confirmed in community. But that's not how it happened. So the question becomes, what happened? Why did things change? Well, one of the main reasons things change is that the church does what the church has done too many times, and that is that it borrowed its leadership structure from the secular world around. So the Greco-Roman world of the day had two realities that were important to this discussion. One was the kleros, the clergy, that was the magistrate that was in control and that governed. The other were the laos, the people out there, uneducated rabble. It was a very clear two-tiered system. And the church borrowed that. By the time of the Middle Ages, it had become ensconced. Deep and strong. Two brief quotes. Robert Slocum first. 
In the period of church history prior to Martin Luther, the church taught that only priests, nuns, and monks had vocations. Everyone else in the church simply had jobs. The unfortunate assumption was that God only called religious professionals. By that time, that's where the church was. That's heretical to the New Testament. Because here's the truth. I believe, I believe God's call on my life. I'm honored by it to do what I do. But it is exactly the same as His call on your life. You're in medicine, God calls you to that. Dentistry, He's called you to that. If He's called you to whatever other profession it might be, music, acting, filmmaking, writing, building houses that people can live in, in safety and peace. God has called you and equipped you and gifted you for that. The only difference between that call and my call is what it's to, not any level, not any specialness. God has called every one of you as much as he has called me. But that was not what was happening in the church of the Middle Ages. Second quote by Greg Ogden. The church adhered to the assumption that there were two kinds of people, clergy and laity. Ordination was interpreted as a kind of second baptism that lifted the clergy into a superior stage of Christian achievement. Clerical garb symbolized their elevated status. So we're going to dress different in order that we can show how different and above you we are. And yet we come to Peter. And what does Peter say? You are all living stones. You're becoming a part of that temple that God is building in the world where God will live. And you are all God's laos, God's people. The New Testament destroys the clergy laity distinction because all leaders and members are part of God's people. So what does that mean for us? What does that look like for us? Two take-homes. The first one is this. Celebrate who you are. Celebrate who you are. Back to 1 Peter, verse 10 again. Notice what Peter says. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy... Now you've received God's mercy. So celebrate that. Celebrate who you are. Celebrate what God has done for you. Celebrate the fact that you stand on the, the even level ground at the foot of the cross with every other one of us. Celebrate who you are. Woody Allen, who has a lot of reasons not to celebrate. Woody Allen said, my greatest regret in life is that I'm not someone else. Truth is, he's not alone in that. There are many people who regret who I am. Regret. Let that be no part of the laos of God. Celebrate who you are. Reading a book right now called Tempered Resilience on Leadership. Excellent book by Todd Bolsinger. Bolsinger tells of being in Canada. 2006, it was the Canada Ironman Triathlon. He was there attending the event. The night before the triathlon, they had met, and there was a speaker. Of all things, the speaker was a nun, a Catholic nun. She was not there just to give the invocation or the prayer. She was there to speak. She was quite a remarkable woman, Sister Madonna Buden. She was called the Iron Nun. She would go on a few years later at 82 years old to finish the Ironman triathlon. 2.4 miles of swimming, what is it? 10 point whatever miles of bike riding, 26.2 miles of running. Finished at 82 years old, a nun. I read that and I thought, then I really felt inadequate. <laughs> What's your excuse? So she stood up and she talked to these athletes on the eve of what they were going to do. I want to read you her words. Bolsinger says that evening her message was simple. And then these are her words. Tomorrow, when things get tough out there, remember... You were loved into existence. If you get discouraged and want to quit, if you get injured and can't finish, 
If things don't go the way you hope, even though you have trained for this day for months or even years, even then remember you were loved into existence. And then Bolsinger says, a competitor herself with several age group world records in several running events to her name she wanted to remind that group of dedicated performers that the most important thing about them was true even before they had performed at all. Even before their tennis shoes hit the pavement, they were loved. Celebrate who you are. Second take home, live who you are. Live who you are. So back to 1 Peter 2. This time, verse 9, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, he says, But you're not like that, for you're a chosen people, you're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very special possession. And then listen. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. You can show others the goodness of God. In other words, you don't keep it all trapped inside here hiding it from anyone else. Peter says, celebrate who you are and then go out and live like who you are because you can show others the goodness of God. The author, Carrie Overbruner, writes about being at the gym. He says, working out, you know what it is, try to get in some kind of zone, try to block out everyone else and stay focused on what it is that you're doing. He says, I was trying to do that. But there was this, this older gentleman who was kind of in the middle of things he was trying to do something with his, I don't know, it was an iPhone or an iPod. I don't know how long ago it was, trying to get, and it just wasn't working. It could, he seemed very frustrated. And Overbrunner says, I thought, ah, I don't want to do this, but maybe Jesus has put him in my path today. So he walked up to him, can I help you? Fell into conversation. I want to read you in Overbrunner's words what happened. Against his initial wishes, he says, I visited in him his apartment. Turns out his wife had died a couple of years before and all his earthly possessions were crammed into a small apartment. She had been their main breadwinner, so the bank repossessed his house when he was unable to make the payments. Bob was his name. Bob and I made a makeshift space in his back room near his desktop computer. One at a time, I imported his jazz CD collection onto his hard drive, intending to transfer the MP3s eventually to his player. While importing his music, Bob and I talked about his life, his wife, and God. The weeks following, I checked in on Bob often. Kind of funny how two guys who were complete opposites can become the best of friends, all because of an MP3 player. Bob is 71, I'm 32. Bob is black, I'm white. Bob doesn't have much money, I have more than I need. Bob is an ex-convict, I've never been to jail. Bob is a widower, I'm married. In short, we're opposites. A short time later, I invited Bob to church, deeply desiring for him to meet Jesus. After a few invitations, he eventually accepted and sat with my wife and me last spring. If he felt awkward sitting in our mostly white church, he didn't let on. After the service, we knelt near the altar, and Bob told Jesus that he wanted to follow him. Bob confessed that he wanted to stop trying to control his own life and invited Jesus to take over. Bob wept. And when I looked into his eyes, I noticed the distinct peace that now defined his face. Bob changed my life. He changed my life and the life of my church. I get more joy from him than he'll ever understand. Whenever I say goodbye to him or hang up the phone after talking with him, he always tells me to give my love to your family. He wants me to baptize him this June at our next baptism. I'm saddened by the reality that I almost miss Bob simply because I was too engrossed in my own little world. You know, maybe that's how we live out who we are. We come here, we celebrate who we are. The worship this morning was magnificent. We come and we celebrate who we are, thanking God that we're part of the laos of God, the people of God, that we're all equally called. But then we have to do something. 
For some, the way you live that out is here in this community, here in Anthem, here at Loma Linda University Church, in some method of service. We're thankful for you and glad for you, but we can't use all of you in that way. And the truth is, there's a world out there that needs you even more desperately than we do. So the way in which you will live out the reality of who you are as the laos of God will be in the gym or in the hospital or in the boardroom or at the construction site or in the cockpit of an airplane. The bottom line is your call to live that out. God has placed his call on your life. It's just as real as the call on anyone else's life. He has a plan and a purpose for his laos, his people, to change the world. So you may have somebody at some point tell you, you can't do that. You're just an unprofessional layperson. You know how you need to respond to them? You just stick your chest out and say, that's right. That's exactly right. Just like Jesus wants it. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for your call on every life here. Empower us to celebrate who we are, to live out who we are as the laos of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, that was an awesome message by Pastor Randy. I uh, hope you're able to live that out this week in your life, realizing that it's not just the paid ministers. Uh, you are a minister as well. God calls us to be ministers. Um, so glad you could join with us. A couple ways that you can help us financially. You can give online by texting LLUC to the number on your screen, or you can go to LLUC.org slash give. We're able to give as well. Also, make sure to follow what is happening at Anthem by going to Anthem by LLUC, Instagram, Facebook, all social media platforms. We'd love to stay connected with you. So glad you could worship with us. We'll see you next week.